I don't know about you, but since it was released in 2019, I was always wondering what is this GitHub Actions thing? I mean, with a name like that, it could be pretty much anything. Well, after some extensive research, it turns out that it's just a CI tool, much like our good friends Jenkins, GitLab and Travis. Now, don't get me wrong, as far as CI tools go, it's a good one. A great one, in fact an easily configurable hosted CI solution that in many cases is free to use. Yes, it will cost you sweet Fanny Adams, nada, zilch. Even better, it's completely integrated into the GitHub ecosystem so you can manage everything from a single user interface. Guys, I think we might have a Jenkins killer on our hands. I'm excited about this. Aren't we tired of managing CI infrastructure we're ready to be set free. Join me as we take a deep dive into GitHub Actions, exploring step-by-step -step how to set up continuous integration for a real Gradle project. Let's get right into it. Before we jump into a worked example though, I want you to meet my colleague. Hello. This is Mr. Developer, and he wants to push some code to our repository, which already has continuous integration set up with GitHub Actions. To learn about GitHub Actions and its terminology at a high level, let's see what happens when Mr. Developer pushes his code change. Mr. Developer pushes the code, which creates a push event in GitHub. Push is just one of many events. Push triggers something called a workflow. This is your CI pipeline defined in a YAML file in your repository. The workflow has a job which runs in its own virtual machine called a GitHub Action Runner. In the runner, the job can access a workspace directory where you check out the source code. A job has multiple steps which get run in sequence. There are two types, actions and commands. Action steps are reusable components available from the GitHub marketplace. Two useful actions are actions slash checkout and actions slash setup Java, which we'll use later. Command steps are instructions like Gradle W build or anything supported by the operating system. Steps run against the workspace. In this example, the actions slash checkout action puts the source code in the workspace. Then the Gradle W build command builds the application. The workflow succeeds or fails. This time it fails, automatically emailing our developer. His enthusiasm quickly disappears. Uh -oh. Now it's time for the main event. Let's take a Gradle project already in GitHub and add all the secret source needed to get it building in GitHub Actions. If you want to follow along, you'll need a GitHub account and a repository with a Gradle project ready to build. Note that this is a private repository for demo purposes, but if you want to see the fully working example, you can access the public version by following the link in the description. First up, we'll create the workflow file which defines what we want to happen when certain events occur in our repository. The file lives within a .github slash workflows directory. So we'll create a file gradle.yml, but the file name isn't really important. Let's build up our workflow configuration line by line. Name gives the workflow name of CI, which is the name you'll see appear soon in the GitHub UI. On defines a list of events that trigger this workflow, in this case push. The workflow will run whenever code is pushed to any branch of this repository. Jobs in our case is a single job called build and runs on specifies the GitHub Action Runner type to use. We'll use Ubuntu, but you can also pick Windows and Mac OS virtual machines. Steps defines the work we want to run inside our runner. In our case, it needs to check out the code, install Java, then build the Gradle project. The first step is an action type step, which uses a GitHub provided actions slash checkout v2. The action contains a version number to ensure consistent behavior every time. The second step is another action type step using actions slash setup Java v2, also provided by GitHub. We provide a name for the action, which helps identify what it's doing in the GitHub UI. Using with, we can pass input parameters to the action, which in this case is required to specify the Java version and distribution. 
The final step is a command type step which runs the build task using the Gradle wrapper. That's all there is to it. At this point, let's commit and push the file and GitHub will take care of the rest. Oh, and let's not forget to make our Gradle W file executable or we won't get very far. Now in my repository in the GitHub UI, let's see what it's doing by clicking the Actions tab. We can see our new workflow with a workflow run marked as in progress. If you see it say queued here, that means that GitHub is provisioning resources to run your job. It normally moves to in progress after a few seconds. I'll click on the workflow run and we see details of the job that's running. We only have a single job called build, so there's not much to see here. I'll click on the job name to see its full details. At this point, the workflow has successfully completed, which is why it's now marked in green. We can see an entry for each step in our workflow job. Clicking on a step shows more details. For example, clicking Build with Gradle gives us the console output showing Gradle starting up. I'll click Actions again and we see the workflow run now marked as success in green. Awesome! We just successfully executed a workflow run using GitHub Actions. Pretty simple, don't you think? This is the most straightforward setup for building Gradle projects, but we'll look at some other scenarios later. First though, let's consider performance. I'll trigger another workflow run by committing and pushing a whitespace change. Once the workflow run completes, you can see that the run durations are about the same. Sounds sensible? Well, no actually. Our friends at Gradle HQ have done a lot of work on caching to make subsequent builds quicker than the first. For example, if we look into the build with Gradle step for our latest workflow run, we'll see Gradle downloading the wrapper again. That's bad because it should be cached in the .gradle slash wrapper directory. Gradle also caches dependencies, so you don't need to download them on every build. That saves a lot of time. This problem is happening because our GitHub Action Runner is created fresh for every workflow run, so Gradle's local caches are forgotten. The next time the Gradle build runs, the cache has to be regenerated. Fortunately, Action slash Setup Java v2 already has Gradle caching built in, and we just need to enable it. It's literally a one-line change to pass the cache Gradle input parameter. Let's commit and push the change. The workflow run that executes now will save Gradle's cache on GitHub servers. The performance improvements will depend on your specific application, but for this project, it's around 15 seconds faster with the cache enabled. And if we look at the build with Gradle step, we can see that the wrapper is no longer being downloaded. Less stuff is always better in my opinion. Okay, that was a lot of code stuff, so time for a quick pause. If you now know how to set up Gradle projects to build in GitHub Actions, but before you go and GitHub Actionize every repository you can get your hands on, there's a bit more you need to know. There's actually another way to build Gradle projects using an action created by Team Gradle themselves called, wait for it, Gradle Build Action. I won't go into all the details, but basically it adds extra functionality, including more advanced caching, easy access to the Gradle build scan URL, and the ability to build projects using different Gradle versions. And it's just as easy to implement in a workflow file as the approach you've just seen. If this feature sounds interesting, head over to the article that accompanies this video linked in the description to learn more. Now I've got one more thing to show you. Let's extend our continuous integration workflow to handle the scenario where somebody wants to merge code into our repository's master branch by creating a pull request. By the way, all the examples from this video can be viewed in the Gradle GitHub Actions example repository linked in the description. Check out the readme file to see how it's all set up. The simple workflow we've used so far is only triggered by one event, push. This means the only time the workflow will run is when we push code, nothing else. Interestingly, given this configuration, the push event will fire on any branch. That means if we create a branch and push it, the workflow will run to ensure the build works on that branch too, 
pretty cool. But a typical workflow in a GitHub repository involves creating a pull request to merge a feature branch into the master branch. Much better would be to have our workflow be triggered when the pull request is created. For that, we have the pull request event, which does two things. It triggers a workflow run when a pull request is opened, reopened, or synchronized. And synchronized happens when the feature branch is updated. And it includes the result of the workflow run in the pull request itself. Let's try it out by adding the pull request event to our workflow file. I'll commit and push the change to the master branch. And we can see it still successfully builds on GitHub. Now we'll create a branch from master called PR test, make a minor change, then commit and push it. This immediately kicks off a new workflow run triggered by the push event. We see in the GitHub UI that the workflow run is building the PR test branch. Now let's create a new pull request to test the pull request event. The pull request is from the PR test branch into master. We see this box showing that a workflow run is now in progress for this pull request. Once the workflow run succeeds, everything is marked as green, including the merge pull request button. But notice that the pull request shows results from two workflow runs. One triggered by the push event on the PR test branch and one by the pull request event on the master branch. Now listen carefully as this gets a bit confusing. The pull request event is fired when a pull request is created to merge the feature branch into master, but the workflow run triggered by this event runs against the feature branch itself. This makes sense as that's the code we need to check is working properly before it gets merged into master. Fortunately, there's a way to make this a bit cleaner by filtering by branch, so we only have the one workflow run showing up. By default, events will fire on any branch. We can tell GitHub Actions to only respond to events on specific branches like master. Let's do that for both push and pull request by making this change to the on section of our workflow on the master branch. This change means that any pushes to the master branch will trigger the workflow and any pull requests raised to merge into the master branch will also trigger the workflow. And I'll make that change on the master branch and merge it into the PR test branch. Now our pull request shows only a single successful check. That's much cleaner. Note that the pull request event triggers even if the pull request is from an external repository which is ideal for validating potential project contributions. OK, so things are coming together nicely now. This setup is probably good enough for many projects, but what other magic can GitHub Actions do for us? Well, there's quite a lot, but here are three of my favourites. First up, ever wondered how those GitHub status badges work, normally shown on the repository readme page? Well, GitHub Actions will generate one for you, which you just have to include in your README file. Next is another Gradle-related GitHub Action, this time to validate the Gradle wrapper. This improves security by ensuring that the Gradle wrapper.jar file in your project matches one of the jars pre-approved by Gradle. And there's also an action which will save an artifact from your workflow run. One use case for this is to save your test reports generated by the Gradle test task. Now, when the inevitable test failures happen, you'll have something to fall back on. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. To provide some balance, let's look at three disadvantages of using GitHub Actions for building Gradle projects. First up, although GitHub Actions scales horizontally very well, with up to 20 concurrent jobs running on the free account, the vertical scaling is a bit limited. For example, the GitHub Actions runner for Ubuntu is fixed to a two-core CPU and seven gigabytes of RAM, and you can't go beyond that. This could be a limitation if you're running heavy workloads, such as compiling large Java code bases. It's worth noting, though, that GitHub do allow you to run self-hosted runners. These are runners which you manage and pay for, but which hook into the GitHub ecosystem. 
Secondly, some businesses may have a requirement not to use hosted services like GitHub to store their code. Unlike other version control management tools like GitLab, GitHub doesn't have a self-hosted option. Finally, although GitHub has many actions available within its marketplace, the level of customization isn't as great as other tools like Jenkins, which even lets you customize the UI as you like. My personal opinion though, is that the advantages of having a hosted CI solution that's very easy to set up and is integrated with version control management far outweighs any downsides. But of course, this will depend on your project's specific requirements. So you've seen that GitHub Actions is a powerful feature to easily add CI to your Gradle projects. It's relatively new and will likely get better as GitHub release more core features and new actions become available on the GitHub Marketplace. Now over to you. I'm interested to know what feature of GitHub Actions would convince you to start using it. And also, if you're not convinced, why not? Finally, if you want to learn more about the fundamentals of building Gradle projects, then check out my free course, Get Going With Gradle. Thanks a lot for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.